Hello, welcome to the Bossit Podcast with Mark Edwards and Michael Humblett. This podcast is released every week and is an over-the-shoulder look of a frank and candid discussion between two experienced software executives, providing you with useful tips, techniques, and the latest concepts to help you grow your software business in the fast-paced digital age. So let's get into it. Here is Mark Edwards and Michael Humblett. Michael, are you there? I'm there, I'm there. Excellent. I know you're, you're always rushing around. Yes. You're probably going to rush off after this. Although I'm going to take a bit of an early Friday and I'm going to have a, an easy weekend because it's been really hectic over the last two weeks. But uh, I understand you've got to rush off immediately we finish this call. Yeah, it's been one of those weeks also. So uh, I actually was on a stage for a lot of people this week. And I completely underestimated the amount of people. So I basically, you can imagine, Mark, you show up to this event and you look around, you think, and suddenly you see your own picture on this massive, massive television wall. And then you go like, okay. And then they take you to this room and then you suddenly see 300 people sitting there and like, I should have really prepared maybe a little bit better. (laughs) (laughs) So how did it it go? So when people are listening, nobody noticed it. All on the but inside I was like, good God! <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, it worked, huh? I, I I truly am a strong believer. Instead of, I mean, the 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 after the talk, I had so many connections on LinkedIn. And I had people asking me questions. I had so much feedback. I mean, you need to make sure that as a business owner, you need to be on the stage at least once a month or every six weeks because you can get to a reach which. Normally, you it's very hard to get there via social. It's a, it's an interesting um, point that you bring up, actually, um, because I was thinking and I was talking with somebody this week about business owners being able to present their business, taking the opportunity of getting out to a much, much wider audience. And um, I'm always quite disappointed in how poorly a lot of business owners pitch their own business. They're, they're usually, well, I say they're usually okay. Quite often, even on a one-to-one basis, they get far too complex. The, the, it becomes a bit of a ramble. I think where somebody, if you've never met somebody before and you needed to be able to just give them that introduction to your business, you really should have that nailed. Um, and then when there is an opportunity, because opportunities can spring up at short notice, maybe to jump up on a stage. And again, I've seen business owners get up on a stage and talk about their business and not really making it clear what they do or why we should be interested. I don't know if you've seen that. Yeah, it's it's a lot. I think they're just too deep into the details and then it's hard to yeah. give a distance. I, I actually had the same At a certain stage, because people ask me, so you're going to speak about what? What are you going to do? Can you give me an introduction? And you write these long things. And then I basically started asking other people, what would you say about me? Or what would you say this company is doing? And then what you got there was like, in one sentence, the essence. And I thought, no, that's a good trick, actually, to ask other people. So what do you think I do? Or what does my company do? And you'll get a completely different picture. And it's much more elevator pitch because they don't know any of the details. Last week, I asked a um, shareholder from a company to just give a 90-second pitch, and they got quite annoyed with me. They said, you haven't given me any preparation. <laughs> I thought, you've been running oh, yeah. this business for 15 years. Yeah. <laughs> How much preparation do you need to be able to pitch your own business? 90 seconds? Really? Yeah. But that's – it's not unusual. People get too close to it, but it's, it's quite important. And I yeah, think you, yeah. I know you that you're a great believer of getting up on stage and, and being able to talk to a, a, a big audience. Mm-hmm. And wh- I mean, well, how do you do that? How do you go about that? Where do you get those opportunities from? Well, I, I basically in the beginning, I, I, I basically hustled them. I mean, I thought I need to be on the stage because nobody knows Michael. So let me find an interesting title. So what I would do actually is uh, I would phone up these um how do you say the event organizer? And I would say, hey, I'm Michael and I have a crazy idea. <laughs> Everybody wants to listen to a crazy idea. Yeah. And then I said, look, uh, all of my customers ask me the same question and I want to be come to your station and answer the bloody question. Yes. And, and 
they know you have an audience then. They know it's going to be interesting. And then, of course, you need to figure out an interesting title, which is tough. And then, and then you basically, what I like to do, and I mean, you know, I do this. I just basically set the challenge. I set the date. I get for it. And then I'll worry about getting all the content later, right? And, and then you finally get the content. And I think you should, in the beginning, it's all hustling and grinding to get in. That's the basic thing. Once you get to it, and if you like doing it, you yes. get feedback then 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 you you're on you're on a roll yes do you think having the youtube channel helps in being able to get that opportunity because i think yeah. you've, you've had a youtube channel now is it a year yes yes last week thanks for asking mark i was waiting for the question so <laughs> since a year i'm so proud uh, i got an email from uh, from youtube actually saying hey one year ago exactly one year you started your channel and I have about, let's say, 30,000 views and, and almost 700 subscribers. And I have to say it really, really worked from a personal brand slash thought leadership position because I set out to make one movie a week and I kept it up. So I've been making one movie a week, posting about it, talking about it and really sharing my expertise. But really, like, I really tell everything, my best ideas, I just share because I want to, to, it's not because I share my best ideas that people can operationalize it and that's why they would hire me. Mm. But I really absolutely believe in the power of the whole video and I think you have a look at the channel and you'll see that, I mean, for me it really worked. And now people come to me and say, hey, can you, that story, can you come and tell that a bit more detail on stage? What's the, what do you think are the, the key things that you've learned through having that? I mean, it's not a long time. No, no. A year, no. but it, I would say... It, if you've if you've been out and thirty thousand people have seen you within a year, how else would you have achieved that amount of of widespread? You view? can't. No. I I think the key, Mark, is you pick your topic and and you just I think consistency is key. Keep it up. Just keep it up and make it better the whole time. So don't so don't uh, try and 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 and. Uh, how to say, just iterate slowly as you go, try and change, try and find, but just keep going. Most people kind of get up, they start and then they give up. No, yes. I've been really consistent. And I also believe in the tier of the sales machine. It's like you need to be really, really consistent. I think that's number one. That's the biggest thing. Just be consistent. And then you, the next thing is, yeah, but where do you find the content? Well, you basically answer the questions of your customers. Yes. And I'll give you yes. a good tip, Mark. Something I never thought about, but a few weeks ago, I suddenly realized there is a, there is a site called Quora.com. I don't know if you know that. That's where people actually yes. ask questions and people answer. Bloody hell. All of the questions you can imagine for the movies, they're on Quora. That's where people go to ask questions. Just check there and you have everything, even answers if you want. Yes. Yeah. So it, it, it just needs to be something to spark your imagination, your thinking quite often. Yep. I used to find that. Yeah. Um, I, when I started doing um, LinkedIn posts or when I very first started doing blog posts, I'd never done it before. I thought I, there was the first few were easy and then I thought I'm, I'm going to run out of ideas. And actually what I used, because I always wanted to illustrate each of my blog posts, I used my photographs, which sounds yep. crazy. But I thought, how does that photograph, I'd pick a photograph, how does that relate to some point within software or the M and A world, yeah, and it just sparked my imagination. And, and come also, up I'm I'm pretty sure you went through the same thing. In the beginning, you try to over perfect things. You really think through way too much, while you should actually tune that down and and basically move faster. Because I think that's the only way to keep it up. Be yourself. Yes. Really, I mean, it sounds so. I mean, like yeah, but at the end of the moment, it's easy to be yourself. Yes. Yes, yeah. It, yeah. it's it's about creating an identity of the individual, isn't it? So that people feel that they know you. Yeah, I mean, exactly. It's it's one of the reasons why we're doing this podcast, isn't it? People can listen exactly. to us. We haven't exactly. scripted this. We're just talking. We make mistakes. We'll say we'll say some interesting things. We'll say some stupid things. But you get to know us as we really are. Hey, Mark, I have another question for you. Okay. You might have noticed. I mean, I think it must be incredibly hard not to notice but gdpr is like oh. i'm going nuts oh, <laughs> every day i get 50 oh. emails i'm like oh, so dear. i'm just wondering what, what what's your experience <laughs> with it let's, let's have well, a quick chat not too long about but we need to talk about it yeah yeah we do i suppose um 
it's quite funny. I, I don't know if you were, I don't know if you ever look at my Twitter posts, but I did a post yesterday or the day before, and I, I put up a bit of a sarcastic comment, and I said, "Could anyone point me in the direction of a GDP article? I haven't read one or seen one for fifteen minutes now." Yeah, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's how I feel at the moment. Um, I think, um, I think there's a lot of consultancies, individual consultants, that they see this as a great money earning opportunity and from my perspective and it, it may not be typical but i think there's a lot of people perhaps i have seen that it's just they've just flooded the market with gdpr it's just everywhere um it's you know we've seen similar things before year 2000 um the people that can remember that yeah and, exactly I mean, at the time, 1999, you would have think that in 2000 that the world was going to come to an end. And when that clock ticked over, you know, people were almost hanging on to their chairs saying, what's going to happen? And guess what? Nothing. It's not quite the same with GDPR, but it, um, it's been overhyped. So, so I agree fully. Uh, however, I had one. I was sitting in a, in a, in a business and there was, they had invited the GDPR lawyer and he was going through all the stuff. And, mm. and at a certain stage, he said something really interesting for me, something I never thought about. He said, you know what? Just make sure that from the outside at the beginning, it looks like you're GDPR compliant because he feels that there will be a lot of competitors trying to kill each other that way because you can block a business completely by this. That's interesting. Well, he says so. Yeah, that's a very interesting take. So I never even thought about this, and I'm thinking, good God! So if I have a competitor, I just basically, <laughs> I just basically attack him because yes. you can do that anonymous, and they'll be busy for a while. But that's really scary stuff. Yeah, I think I, I hadn't thought of that. I know. I mean, that's why I'm saying I, yeah, to you. This is this is good stuff. You yeah. you must have thought about this in advance. <laughs> no, but when you said a, when you said the, the words together, GDPR and lawyer, and you had lunch with them, I was thinking the most the best thing that they could say to me was goodbye. I think. <laughs> but uh, no, that is actually very good. I think he's right, and I have seen. I mean, when um, most companies that really wanted to be proactive with their marketing were creating a, a lot of email. I know that there were competitors, and I'd heard of this, that were getting their competitors blacklisted. Yeah. Because yeah. it was quite easy to do. And then the emails yeah. were going out, and they were getting blocked. Yeah. So, yes, absolutely, I can see that happening. So so I, I hear you thinking, damn, I need to look relook at my site, <laughs> get it all well, right. <laughs> I'm the same. I'm like, I have yeah. a few days left. I will do this <laughs> this weekend. No, we, we, I mean, we have got a plan in place. Um, I was involved with it a little bit, but as little as possible. It's, <laughs> it's just one of those things you know you've got to do, um, but you probably don't enjoy doing it. It's, uh, it's, like, it's a bit like creosoting your fence, isn't it? I mean, you've got to do it every now and again, but you're not going to have fun. Who, who says I'm, I'm dying to get home to creosote my fence? It's a bit like GDPR. Don't really want to uh, spend too much time thinking about it, but it just—it's just been everywhere, hasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And then I had another question while we read it. I was chit-chatting with a um, uh, let's say a business leader, somebody who runs a company, and he asked me about some uh, something around like uh, the the M and A part, and and he yep. said to me, Michael, you know, I'm I'm really concerned about all this, and we had this long chat, and I'm just wondering. Do you, do you get a lot of concerns around it? Do you get people that are afraid? or well, You must be encountering a lot of those questions more than I do. I do, and I have done more recently since we've been running the seminars. Because yeah, really. you, you, you get to meet more people and um, they come up and speak to you afterwards. After we've, we've sort of dispelled some of the myths and misconceptions and they get a bit of a feel for you. I think, again, they get, there's a little bit of trust that builds up. Either we've met them before, or maybe this is the first time at the seminar. But the, typically, our seminars are you know, you, you've been there so three hours and we're presenting. I think a bit of trust builds up and they come up to us and they open up a little bit. And it's been quite interesting to hear people say to me, or almost imply that, that they want to sell their business, but they feel like that it's making them feel bad that they're selling out, you know, they're doing something wrong. And I think absolutely it's not. 
I actually have seen the complete opposite where you can see that the founders really guys with a lot of energy very very motivated they wanted to create a business because they saw an opportunity they had an idea they had a solution in mind they've done that they've created it and then they're taking the business to the next stage and maybe the next stage after that and then their vision of what running this business was like changes and their motivation goes and I don't think I think for a lot of people maybe all everybody really you can't fake motivation and when the motivation goes for them that really is dangerous um, so I think that if you think about that business as a separate entity to yourself which you do need to think about it in that way you've got customers you've got the technology itself or the, the solution the service you've also got employees that depend upon it and unfortunately I've seen a lot of um, software tech owners just drive their business into the ground you know, they just keep it going and going long after they should have left it's yeah. not always it's not always down to just those key shareholders or executives losing motivation. I think sometimes the market changes. A uh, big player comes in. The, the, yeah. Perhaps there is a government compliance regulations which changes the market and they're not able to compete. It needs a bigger organization with more resources. Or they're operating, they're very, very strong in a small niche and they've saturated that area. And, yeah. you know, if you're looking, if you're looking at exiting the business and this could be age related or it could be down to a number of other factors, you want to go for another opportunity. You, you probably don't want to put a big investment into a business when you know that you're probably not going to be there more than another three years. It's very difficult to get that return on that investment within that period. So uh, I think that that's sorry, somebody's ringing me. I'm just going to turn this off. So you see it's live, eh, people? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, I think that that is, um, well, they're just, they're just a couple of the reasons, really, that, that people need to, to view their business as being separate to themselves, and they need to realize that on many occasions, the sale of their business is really essential. It, it, it can be almost selfish to hang on to it any longer. Um, I think... Also, some of the software entrepreneurs that I've seen, really good guys. They've, they've been through a difficult journey, maybe over three, four, five, ten years, gained a lot of experience. They would be better off in, in cashing in on the equity, the value that they've created. Go and do it again with a fresh slate. I mean, I can remember being in that position, working in a number of organizations, having my own business, and then sitting down one, one day and saying, I'm going to start a new business, but I'm going to I'm going to bear in mind all those mistakes I made previously, and really design it from the ground up. That's a great feeling. But if you you know, I think for those people that have built value and they can bank some money, they've probably got some money that they they're willing to to play with. They may have built up relationships with investors or other executives that want to come in with them. That ride the second time typically is a lot easier. Mm -hmm. and, and some, if you look out there, there's some really very highly successful entrepreneurs. And I'm, I don't mean highly successful from just from the perspective of they've accumulated a lot of money. I think from the perspective that they um, are doing something that they really love um, and they've got a good work life balance. And, and, you know, they may be involved in several businesses. Yeah. No, I also see that most company owners have multiple businesses. I rarely encounter, they yeah. only have one. It's like something within their system, seeing opportunities and, and growing and trying and experimenting around. Yes, yeah, I think that's true. I think I think perhaps there's, a, there's more of a tendency nowadays. Um, perhaps that's partly due to the fact that distance isn't such a barrier now. Uh, true and and I do get I do see more and more I mean sales and marketing I see more and more independent people I really see more and more uh, consultants I mean let's call it consultants but uh, it's like like employees that that are being self-employed. That's interesting. Yes, yeah. it's um, I think you know many many years ago when I had a recruitment business, 
there was quite a few uh, independent salespeople. I think that they found it quite tough, but it seems to be more accepted. And there's some very good people out there that have really sort of forged a path through their own success. And it seems to be that there's more business owners that have benefited um, because there are certain sectors of the industry where I think that it's very difficult to get good salespeople. Especially when you, once you go up into the bit more seniority and higher salaries, you see yes. a lot more uh, contractors, let's call it like that. Hmm. So, uh, People and can I mean, come yeah. in and they can, they can sort of dump their experience within a short time frame. And it's yeah. probably somebody that that organization couldn't afford on a long term basis, but they can get a great deal of benefit of that experience over the short term. Yeah. That makes sense. I think that's also how. how how they're being used and there is some risk of course for those people uh but that's that's a completely different topic um yes uh, the 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 thing uh, another thing i because i mean i'm really jumping to to another topic um go for it i was on this sales event this week yes and i had like everybody talking to me about chatbots and sales because gdpr is there and then you need to capture the attention once you're there. And then they started talking about artificial intelligence. And then everybody was artificial intelligence. <laughs> I'm like link, really looking at it. And I'm like one, most of the artificial intelligence is not, is really simple stuff. They just <laughs> look like that. I mean, it's ridiculous. I'm like, guys, come on. This is really simple. Absolutely. Yeah. And then the chatbots. Yes, I get it. And I do see more conversion via chatbots, but still you need to get the people to the landing page. You still need to be relevant and all of that. But I do, I do feel. For the first time, especially with GDPR, you just can't do the mail blasts anymore. So I do expect, looking into the future, a lot more uh, the stuff we are doing on LinkedIn. And I, I do I do see really a world coming where there are going to be a lot more movies, a lot more personal branding, and people trying to scale their sales that way, actually. Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, the, I think that's been happening for some time, and GDPR yeah. will probably accelerate that. Yeah. And I think that there will be a lot of organizations playing catch up. If they haven't been testing and experimenting, then they've got to run really fast now to catch up. Yeah. The big question is going to be like larger corporates. I'm not talking about scale ups and smaller organizations because that's way easier and faster. But the real lar large organizations, how they will implement some of this, I'm really curious and looking forward to see because they have the money and the power. To really flex flex some muscles, so uh, let's let's see what's going to happen there. Yes, yeah. although money and size doesn't always win the day. Um, I think sometimes in a really fast paced industry, which software tech undoubtedly is, some sometimes it's the agility, flexibility that wins, and we yep. are seeing lots of examples of that happening with these smaller startup companies growing very, very quickly and adapting to today's environment. And I think, I think a lot of that comes down to the mindset and the flexibility of those business leaders. If, if you've got somebody who's been in the industry 30 years and he doesn't feel comfortable in today's environment, I think they're going to struggle. Yeah, I know, I, know. I know a lot of companies like that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. They, they sort of... They want yeah. to do what they've always done because that used to work. Yeah, yeah. And although it's not working as well, they don't want to change. And exactly. I'm, I'm a lot into the real estate market now, the real estate brokers that we talked about at last time. Yes. And it's where I really, really see it, like very small organizations and and you have the older guy that's hiring all the younger one and he's stopping them because says, no, Facebook cannot work. And um, I mean, and you're thinking, are you, are you nuts? I mean, for you, it's just like the one place to be. Yeah. And, and I agree. I think that there is just a point where it's just going too fast, not the right word. I know it's just a mentality because I know a lot of older guys that are really, really. Oh, absolutely, quick. yes. I don't, I don't think it's age related. Oh, like, you're right. You can yeah. see, you can see older guys that they 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 enjoy that stimulus of change. Yeah, um, I definitely wouldn't be ageist, especially as I'm getting older myself. You know, <laughs> I think it's down to mentality. Uh, Oh, I didn't want to say that, Mark, but now that you mention, no, no, <laughs> although I, I do notice sometimes, and I'm, I'm getting 42 soon, I do notice that if they give me some of the new, new technology, like uh, stupid things, like I was fighting with a PlayStation here for the kids, and I'm like, look at me struggling with this thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah. I've got a, I've got a question for you because actually it's it's a sort of a question that was thrown at me. Somebody said to me, and we were talking about valuations of businesses, and they said to me, "Why are software companies different then?" And I I would want to ask you the question about: Do you think software salespeople are different? Do you think that it's it there is a difference between selling software than maybe you know something that's more tangible? It's a good one. I didn't I do warn you. There is, a, there is a difference between, let's say, let, let's let's make it very polarized, very black and white. I do mm. think there is a difference between somebody only selling software and somebody only selling services, like consulting. Okay. Because in yes. consulting, you can say, yes, we can do whatever you want. Uh, and you have this approach, whereas you do software, you have to fit whatever they're saying. You have to try and fit that into the requirements so that you can actually say, well, my software is, is the answer to that. And there is a big difference. I, I've seen that people coming from consulting into the software sales world, they struggle. And I see software guys going to consultancy, they suddenly feel like a freedom that, which they never had. <laughs> and yes. then if I have to make another cut, is there is a big difference between classic old school software licensing versus let's say the new style uh lower amounts but recurrent like the SaaS type of uh software sales that's really really different because it's a lot more procedural it's 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 more on you it has to go fast it's smaller amounts but you have like a mechanized approach you have 30 minutes to do it and just move 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 whereas the more old school software approach is like let's have lunch let's have another you know it, it's a bit of a different approach and 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 you really see big differences so when i was in, in when i'm in saas business and i i bring in these let's say more of the solution sales type of guys in they struggle a lot because it just moves too fast yes you just spend too much time on the relationship where where it just needs to move if i flip it round it also doesn't work so so there are the differences i think the borders are a bit vague but if you take them to the extremes yeah then then it's 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 not going to work mm. That's interesting, because that question was thrown at me, you know, and we were talking about valuations, and I was explaining no. about, you know, the value is built up in layers. It's it's not as easy as many people think. But they said, well, why is it different with software? And it's a question I hadn't had for a while, and it did make me yeah. think. Yeah. And, and and I sort of, you, you know, sometimes you hear yourself saying something almost before you've you've you've, you've really sort of consciously processed it. And, and I was talking about the exponential nature of software tech. Exactly. I mean, when you look at the cost base, I mean, there's a development cost. But once that software has been developed, the scalability, yes, you will probably need to add to the number of people. But that's nowhere near the, the, the scale up cost is, for instance, if you were talking about manufacturing, you know, if you're yeah. manufacturing yachts, something. You know, the, manif the scalability of that is totally different. And also, the other thing is the, the growth rates that you see with, with the really big winners out there. And that's what keeps the investors interested in this sector. You see in companies that are growing at growth rates that you can't do a, a you know, the discounted cash flow model type of right. valuation. It I, doesn't, I, it doesn't yeah. work. I have a good example. I helped. Uh, I, I'm a strong believer that the way people sell, not, let's let's call it differently. I'm a strong believer that if you cut sales into prospecting and into let's say um, the sale itself, uh, the closing techniques and all of that, w with the typical inside sales type of model, you can actually speed up a business ridiculously. So I have a friend of mine is in an industrial waste pump uh, business, and I said, let me try. And he looked at me and he said, no, it's never going to work. So I, I tried it on his business and his business like took off like a rocket. It's just ridiculous. Yes. But yes. we immediately after four months hit a wall, which was, he just, he told me, he said, Michael, I can't find any pumps, you know, big industrial pumps. I said, they're all out. I've sold out. It's going to take another two months. For it. So he, he just ran out of stock. Yes. And, and with software, it's exactly what you're saying. You don't, you can never run out of stock. No. No, you can and, run and, out of different things. You can have bugs and other stuff and, and run yes. out of people to help support, but you can never run. You can technically keep selling or go no. into maintenance mode or something and, like that. Yeah. And the difference, the difference in selling your product to 100 people or a million people in the, in the actual yeah. cost of the manufacturing is zero. Yeah. yeah. You may yeah. have to have more support people, but you know, that's, that's, a, that's a much easier thing to manage than it, than it is for a traditional business. 
and, and and I don't think that there are well, there's not a bigger group of business type that grows at the rate. There are a number of you know fast growth companies, but there aren't as many outside of software tech. No, and I know that because we've been doing the analysis on it. It's it's quite amazing. So it's you know if you're in software tech and if you're listening to this podcast, then I would assume that you would be. It's a good place to be if you get it right. And it's I think sometimes one of the things that that we're always aiming to do is see yourself a bit like a chemist, and you're looking at that organisation, and there will always be strengths and there's always going to be weaknesses. And you're putting in a little bit of this and taking out a little bit of that to get that right mixture to hope that it will explode and it will really take off. And it happens. And when it does, wow, the payback is, is enormous. And that's why there's a lot of money floating around in this industry. Always has been. I completely agree with that, Mark. Yeah. I completely agree with that. Well, I know you've got to shoot off. So I yep. think we ought to stop because we're at just over 30 minutes now. Uh, this is the Bossit Podcast. If you've enjoyed what uh, you've heard today, then please subscribe. Even more so, if you've really enjoyed it, then also leave a review because we're on iTunes now. And if you haven't like, liked it, then don't. Just send us an email and tell us why. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Michael. Good, good speaking. Cheers. Bye-bye. Yeah.